Hey, welcome. Good morning. Welcome to the Calvary Cork um, Sunday service. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. I'm Mike. This is my daughter, Rosie. Say hi. Hi. Um, and wherever you're joining us from, if you're on your couch, if you are um, watching this on a, on a big screen or on your phone, thanks for taking time out of your Sunday to hear from God's Word and to worship with us. Um, it's going to be a, a great time together. I want to encourage you, if you're watching this live, like say hi in the comments or in the chats. Let us know where you're watching from. And um, yeah, we're, we'll get through this. We'll get through this. Um, so the announcements, you know, it's a strange time. We had a lot of great events planned and they're all kind of canceled. Here's, here's what you need to do. If you're not already part of our Facebook group, we have a public page and then we have like a private group for like inner church communications. You got to get part of that group. It's called Calvary Cork Life. And you can email info at calvarycork.org and we'll give you the information on how to join this um, community group page. Okay. Um, we have exclusive content on there. We have a Wednesday night Bible study, like an interactive Bible study going through the book of Jonah. We'll be in Jonah chapter two this Wednesday. And then Thursday afternoons, we have um, just a really fantastic kids club um, at 3 p.m. And I brought a real life kid to talk about the kids club. Rosie, why don't you tell us about the kids club? The Kids Club is a really fun thing, and it teaches your kids about God, but they're not going actually to church. They're watching it on live video, and you can comment, and you can watch them with, watch with them, and it kind of helps them. Yeah? Does, does it help you, Rosie? Yeah. How does it help you? It helps me by, like, getting me more into, like, Kids Club, and, like, more into things. Right. So if you want to get more into Kids Club and more into things, then the Lighthouse Beacon is the group for you, okay? Yeah. And, like, there's a funny part. Sometimes Mr. Brandon and Ernie are playing with the Lego thingies, Legos, to act out the thing. It's fun. Yeah, sounds sounds great. Um, so anyway, get connected to the Calvary Cork Life Group. Um, things are changing a lot these times, as, as we all know. And so that's the best way for you to be connected um, with the life of our church community if you're not already there. Okay, we're going to go over to Shane Cronin, and he's going to call us to worship. Hey everyone, Ricky here, and just uh, two more quick announcements for you. On Friday, we have the Compass Youth Group uh, Zoom Bible Study, and that will be on Friday at 7 p.m. And for more info, you can contact uh, info at calvarycork.org, and uh, we'll be sure to send out all the links, and of course on the Facebook group as well. And then also on Friday night at 7.30 is the men's uh, Zoom Bible study. And so for that, we had been going through the book of James, uh, but we decided to shift gears a little bit. And for this season, just go through the book of Philippians, which is just a great, uh, small, little dense book uh, that I'm sure we'll get a lot of out of it. And kind of my hope for it is to really echo what uh, one of the key verses for the book of Philippians is. And that's Philippians 1.27, which, which says... Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And so that is my hope for, um, and the other uh, leaders of, of men's ministry, that is our hope um, for the men of Calvary Cork in this season, that we really, really would be uh, living a life worthy of the gospel, that we would be standing firm in one spirit, also side by side um, for the faith of the gospel. So really looking forward to it. Hope guys that you could uh, meet us there uh, Friday, 7.30. And with that, we will go back to Shane, who will be leading us in our call to worship. Uh, for our call to worship this morning, I'm going to be reading from Psalm chapter 28, verses 6 to 9, which says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. 
O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. So as we're going to go and sing some songs of worship this morning, um, as David uh, had confidence here in God in chapter 28, I have full confidence this morning um, that even though there might be disappointment and discouragement um, because we can't meet uh, and congregate again, um, because we are God's anointed, he is our strength. It's not just that we're strong because of him, um, but he is our strength. It's all him. Um, and we're, as, as it says in the title, and as it says, he's our shield, he's our protector, and we're his. Um, and I can, I can only but want to worship God because of that, because of how um, powerful he is and how he takes care of his church and how we, you know, even though it may seem like we've taken a step back, um, as a nation in this lockdown, um, you know, we can still be encouraged. We can still be so thankful to God um, that he is our strength, he is our shield. Um, so let's worship him this morning for that. Uh, so over to Sharon for worship. Hey, George. Um, it's been a while since um, you've seen my face. Um, I've been in a couple of times, but I haven't been in as much as I would have liked um, into uh, the service. So it's kind of cool to be back leading worship it's a little bit daunting um haven't done this in a while so yeah we shall see how we go um but yeah it's great to be worshiping together even if we can't be physically together um, it's great to be able to to lift god's name high together and um, to worship jesus you know and um, so yeah we're going to sing a couple of songs the first song is lift you high um kian's been doing it a bit and uh yeah i'm gonna have a lash so we'll see how we go
Say 
strong in Savior's love through the song He is Lord Lord of all The next song um, we have actually, actually haven't sung it in ages um, I just need to change the key that it's in because, yeah, that might be a good thing to do. Hmm. What will we play then? We'll play it in this, I think. My fingers aren't used to playing guitar anymore, so apologies for the fumbling. Um, but yeah, it's good to be back doing it. Um, Scandal of Grace is the next song. Um, it's a powerful song. I think it's a powerful song. Oh, to be like you. Give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one besides you. Forever the hope in my heart. And I hope that's that's where our heads are at this morning. I hope that's where our hearts are at this morning. I, uh, yeah, I love this song. Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on that cross. Accused in absence so from the sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my is your sting your power is as dead as my sin the cross has taught me to live mercy my heart now to sing the day and its trouble shall come I know that your strength is enough to be 
Lord, thank you that we can know you. What a joy, what a pleasure, pleasure what, a, what an honor, what a privilege it is to know you. And we can know you so well, Lord. We are yours and you, 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 you have poured out everything for us, Lord. You've given us everything and all you want is a relationship with us. And I just thank you that you came down here. You made it possible for us to know you. I just thank you for that, Lord. I just thank you for your love, for your care for me, for your love and for your care for every single person who is watching this today. Lord, I just thank you for your love. I thank you for the relationship that we can have. In your name, I just, I just pray. Lord, I just pray that Mike's sermon would just speak to the hearts of, of the people who are listening, Lord. Speak to our hearts today, Lord. Help us to know you more in our lives, Lord. I just thank you. In your precious name, I say amen. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a reading from John, uh, chapter 11, verse 45 to chapter 12, verse 11. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one, the children of God, who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, said, Was the ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because... He cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only 
on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Well, thank you so much to Eamon for the reading, and thank you so much, Shar, for leading us in song. Uh, it's been a good couple of months since we've been able to be led by you, Shar, so thank you so much. I'm here with my assistant, Finn. Can you say hi? Hi. Hi. This is Finn, and he'll be here for the first few minutes. We'll just see how this goes. So welcome to Calvary Cork Church at Home. All right, so here's, here's the big idea for today. Here's, here's just something that I think that, that we should know or something that we instinctively know. Um, sometimes there's a cause and that cause leads to a lot of effects. Let me give you an example, okay? So on Monday evening, Monday evening on the steps of the government building, right outside, right, right around 9 p.m., uh, our Tishuk, uh, stepped outside onto the podium and then made a very short speech and says that Ireland is now going to enter into um, stage three of the national framework for living with COVID-19. And because of that cause, now as an effect, we're doing church purely online again. Now, kind of continuing with that theme, that's a cause, that's something that's taken place, and there's effects. And obviously, that cause is affecting different um, industries, the hospitality industry, the sports and exercise world, educational systems, and we hope that it will have a positive effect on the healthcare system. That's like systems, and there also is like the individual effects. I know that most people are just kind of, okay, just getting ready to soldier on through this. There is a vocal minority of people that are actually a little bit upset, saying that how dare the government not follow Neffet's guidelines and we should be in stage five. There also is a vocal minority that says, how dare the government put us on lockdown at all? We should just soldier on. It's a giant step forward, giant step backwards, and we need to just get on with it. So. I'm not going to get into the weeds uh, of that. I'm just saying on Monday something happened and then now we're living with the implications of it. A cause took place and then now we live in the effects. What's taking place in today's passage? Uh, what Amen read to us is essentially the effects that take place from the cause that Jesus did in Acts chapter 11. The cause was that Jesus raised Lazarus from death. He stood outside the grave. He called Lazarus come forth. Lazarus came forth and that impacted institutions and individuals. That's what we're going to see in today's uh, message. Truly, it's an instigating event that forces people to react to it. Uh, this morning, we're going to see it in three different ways. Um, number one, we're going to see that the religious leaders decide to kill Jesus because of Lazarus. Number two, Mary decides to sacrificially worship Jesus at dinner with Lazarus. And then number three, the religious leaders decide to kill Lazarus because of Jesus. And with that as kind of our three ideas, Let's pause very briefly and, and pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless the teaching and preaching of your word as we are in couches and sitting in chairs, watching on phones or laptops or desktops or screens. I pray that your spirit would work in and through us in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so number one, <laughs> you can read that at the end of verse 11. Sorry, the end of chapter 11, that last section, there is the religious leaders deciding to kill Jesus because of Lazarus. 
Now, Eamon did a great job reading it. I, I'm not able to get into all of those verses. It's quite a long, lengthy section. But here we see the pattern just going on and on and on. For those of you that have been journeying with us in the Gospel of John, whether you've been um, meeting with us in person for the past two, sun, um, two months worth of Sundays, or if you've been exclusively watching online, um, but you know that there's been a pattern since like chapter five where Jesus performs a miracle. Jesus does something good, and then the religious leaders get mad. And now it's like the last straw. It's like finally they're so mad that they gather together and they plan Jesus's execution. So you, you can read about it. It's there. You can glance down um, because it says, uh, what verse is that exactly? I believe it's at verse 50. No, verse 47. It says the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. So the council is gathered. Uh, the, the, the word there is actually, it's, it's Sanhedrin and uh, some translations just put it as the word Sanhedrin. The ESV, which I use, renders this as the council. It's this high-powered committee, and, and it's a group of, of men, and they are this combination of both religious and political power. Obviously, whatever power they had is limited, or it's capped. There is a, a glass ceiling over their power that they can have, and that ceiling is called Rome. But under the rule of Rome, they have a certain amount of delegated authority. Um, they're like the highest judicial body in Israel. And, and so to some extent, this is like home rule for them. They're able to govern some things, but obviously Rome is high and above that. Uh, there's 70 members of this Sanhedrin, uh, plus the high priest, who's kind of the, the, the main voice or the main guy in that. I'm not going to get into this too much, but maybe some of you have heard there's a quite a good case that could be made that Saul of Tarsus was part of Saul of Tarsus was part of the Sanhedrin. Saul, who later became known as Paul the Apostle. Anyway, that's a whole other discussion. So there's two main groups within the Sanhedrin. There's the Pharisees who've appeared loads in the Gospel of John so far. And there's the Sadducees, and they are like kind of theological opponents. They usually bicker and argue a lot and disagree about things, but it's been said that their mutual hatred of Jesus unites them into action for this fateful week that's about to begin right now. Um, and so they're, they're talking about it. They're saying this is a threat to our control. If Jesus keeps on performing these miracles and the ordinary peasants keep believing in him, <clears throat> then eventually Rome, our overlords, they're going to be upset and they're going to come and they're going to remove us as the leaders if we can't even manage people ourselves. So they talk about it. And then in verse 50, um, we have the, the high priest say, you guys know nothing at all. So they have, they have good workplace camaraderie. He insults them in verse 49. And then in verse 50, he says, you know what? It's actually better for you that one man should die for the people then the whole nation should perish. He says, if it's going to come down to a matter of, we let this guy continue to like build a crowd, then it's going to cost us because Rome's going to punish the whole nation because of the rabble rousing of this one young miracle working Bible teacher called Jesus of Nazareth. And so what he says is that if he gets popular, then we're all going to be punished for it. There's another cause and effect. If Jesus is popular in his mind, then Rome will, will punish the whole nation. Cause, effect. So what he says, he says it's better that one man should die for the people instead of the whole nation perishing. 
So he, in this passage, kind of unwittingly uses this like sacrificial language, this verbiage of substitution. And unwittingly, he prophesies about the death of Christ for sinners. What's, what is hinted at here is exploded throughout the rest of the New Testament. Here's two verses that I love that speak about the substitutionary nature of the death of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So Caiaphas, he just doesn't understand the implications of that which he just spoke. And and John, the author of this gospel, he kind of like winks at us and almost like lets us in on the joke, where kind of explains a bit of the irony to us. In verses 51, especially verse 52, he explains that that actually is the plan of God, that one man would die for the sake of the whole nation. And then in verse 52, he says, but it's not just the Israelites. It's not just the nation of Israel. It's for all the people who would ever turn and trust in him, the children of God who are scattered abroad. So he accidentally expresses the heart of God for his glorious hope of an international body of believers. So to summarize, Caiaphas' fear is that Jesus would take both our place and our nation. And the reality is Jesus did take our place He tasted death for us. Again, let me say, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took our place. My friends, that's the gospel. And then we jump down to verse 53. It says, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. In their mind, he was as good as dead. They just needed like the opportunity to implement their decision. And so what's going to take place in the next few days is that they are going to find a way to arrest Jesus and to put him to death. That's why when he's arrested on Thursday night, that's why he isn't given a fair trial. Like the decision was made long before the arrest took place. <clears throat> or if you think of kind of like the, the Old West cowboy films, the Sanhedrin look at Jesus and they say, you know what, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. You got to go. So we come to the end of our first thought, okay? So at the end, the first thought is that the religious leaders decide to kill Jesus because of Lazarus. There's a cause, there's an effect. The second one is this. Mary decides to sacrificially worship Jesus at dinner with Lazarus. This is the second one. This is the main point. This is the largest section. This is the most important for you and for me today. Uh, We look at verse 12, sorry, chapter 12, from verses 1 down to verse 8. Uh, We see this very famous, this kind of well beloved passage that I assume that many of you probably have heard once or twice before. But we have this wonderful glimpse of a meal. This is a a dinner party that is thrown in honor of Jesus. Jesus is celebrated at this meal. Um, As it says there, Lazarus has been raised from the dead. You know, the, 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 maybe this is the leftover catering from the wake or from the funeral. And they decide rather than have it be a, a mournful remembrance, 
Let's take this food that we already ordered from the caterers and let's turn it into a party celebrating Jesus. The one who reached into death, pulled Lazarus out, called him forth, and now we get to eat and celebrate together. So Jesus is there, Lazarus is there, and, and many more people from the community are there. It, it's, it's great. There's this wonderful, like, humanizing experience that comes from eating a good meal with friends. You know, I had planned to have a, a meal together with the Calvary Cork ministry heads last Wednesday night. And, and that's been on the calendar for a while, and I've been looking forward to it for, for a long time. There's just like the, the shared enjoyment of good food and good drink, the casual interactions that take place across a table. Um, but there's a cause, and there's an effect, and that meal got canceled. And instead, we had a Zoom meeting instead, which is neither casual nor humanizing. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure that I and many of us can tell stories about good meals in the past and the good meals that we look forward to enjoying with friends in the future. But, but let's imagine this one, the one that we have in our laps, the one that's there described in the first nine verses of John chapter 12. Um, this is, like I said, it's a, it's a very well-known meal because Three out of the four Gospels all describe this meal. We'll put up a slide. You can read about it in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. Um, also, Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, describes a similar instance in the life of Jesus at another meal, but I'm convinced that that's not the same one as this, and we can talk about it further. But this is a valuable like it's a celebratory time for Lazarus's sake and for all the residents of Bethany. But just even think of it personally for Jesus, it could be a time of recharging or gathering strength before the events that we know as the events of Holy Week begin. Starting the next day, things are going to get very busy and intense in the life of Jesus. But so this meal I, I just think about it and piecing together what we know about it from Matthew and Mark and, and here our passage in John. Um, I just think of it as like this glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. You know, Jesus describes like the new heavens and the new earth as a place like full of, of food. We'll talk about this at the Last Supper as he speaks about like, you know, I, I look forward to having this with you again, you know, in my Father's kingdom. So there's this glimpse of even heaven in this meal, okay? It's a place of relationship and joy and appreciation. It's a place of honor. And we think about who's there. Now, Simon isn't mentioned in John's gospel, but he's mentioned in Mark and in uh, Matthew as well. And it's actually his home. He's the host of this. And he is described as Simon the leper. That means that he was somebody that had this infectious skin disease and he was ceremonially unclean, which means that he has been living under like a personal quarantine for much of his life. For him, it's been an unending stage five. But Jesus seems to have this thing for lepers. Uh, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you just see him that he's like constantly healing lepers. His three-year ministry is full of going to those that are isolated, lonely, that are sick, that are unclean and bringing health, wholeness, healing, and community to them. And surely Simon was one of those. He encountered Jesus, and now he's able to have people in his home once again. He was diseased, but now he's healed. 
He was falling apart. But now he's been made whole. He was unclean. And now he's been washed and made whole. He was isolated. But now he's hosting a dinner party in his home. And it's all because of Jesus. Man, isn't that cool? And then kind of go with me from Simon to uh, Martha. Martha is there at the meal. We'll, we'll see here in a second. Um, and she, she could say this. She could say, you know, I was anxious. I was snappy. I used to be a wreck. Um, but now I have peace. Now I can be comfortable in my own skin. And it's because of Jesus. And then, of course, Mary is there as well. She was heartbroken, and now she has genuine joy, and that's because of Jesus. And then, of course, we kind of look at, like, the, 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 the man of honor, the guest of honor, Lazarus, and he could say, guys, that ain't nothing. <laughs> I was dead, but now I'm alive because of Jesus. So we have this, this dinner party, this glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. We have this dinner party, which is kind of a glimpse of Calvary Cork. I mean, how many of us could say some or even all of those things about what we were before and how we have been changed? We've been falling apart, but he's put us together. We've been unclean, but he's washed us. We've been anxious and snappy, but now we're comfortable in our own skin. We've been heartbroken, but now we have joy. We were dead, but now we were alive because of Jesus. So I love this. I love this. And guys, it, it even gets better. It even gets better. They served a dinner for him there, verse 2. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those that was there. Then verse 3, Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. This is um, unlike anything I've ever experienced before. You know, I've, I've had people over to my house. I've been to others' houses and this is uh, never taken place. Um, but, but we, we have Mary. Mary is the one who, again, she features prominently in the last chapter. And what she wants to do is she wants to make this costly, loving, devotional sacrifice to Jesus. Um, and so it says that she pours out this spike nard or nard oil onto his feet. The other gospels say that it was on his head as well. She's kneeling down at his feet. And you know, I think we know this. It's certainly possible to go through religious motions sometimes, right? Um, many of us maybe grew up in religious traditions where you would kneel at certain times, you'd stand up at certain times, um, you would, you know, pass the peace and shake hands at certain times. Um, but for her, this is, this is so authentic. This is not a tradition that she's following. Um, she says, I love Jesus so much, and there's something I want to do for him. So she kneels down, she gets at his feet. For her, this is like humble, it's vulnerable, it's costly. We'll talk about that later on. But we sang earlier, or we listened to Shar sing, <laughs> you know, we lift you high, high within our thoughts and high within our minds. This is a demonstration of what it looks like to, for her to get low and for her to lift up Jesus high. Here's a, here's a quote that I like from Sarah Breyers. Earlier, she sat at his feet to learn because he is the teacher who instructed her and her sister. Now, she kneels at his feet to worship because he is the resurrection and the life who resurrected her brother. So it's this costly act of devotion, of honoring um, the one who rescued her brother. Now we see that although we look at this and think, man, that's, that's incredible, the onlookers 
are not that impressed. Judas is not impressed at all. He says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, having charge of the money bag. He used to help himself to whatever was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will have with you always, but you will not always have me. <clears throat> now, the other gospels say that Judas started it, and then actually the other disciples joined in as well. There's like this holy moment of like hush and awe. Um, maybe it quickly then shifted into awkwardness as maybe it went on for a little bit longer. And someone to break the silence has to say something. And Judas makes this pious sounding platitude that saying this is actually kind of a waste. Have you seen those maybe music videos of like the rapper or the singer, you know, having expensive champagne and like pouring it into a hot tub? You're like, what a waste. Or maybe you've seen those videos on YouTube. They were kind of big a couple of years ago um, called Will It Blend? And they had these like fancy blenders and they would put, you know, iPhones um, inside the blender to see if they could blend it. Anyway, if you haven't seen those, now you have something to do on Sunday afternoon. You could find out what blends. Anyway, maybe for him, all of it just seems like that. Just like totally unnecessary, a big lavish waste. She is saying to Jesus, you're important to me, you're valuable to me. And Judas is not interested in this. <clears throat> He's like, through his even financial creativity <laughs> or through his pilfering of the funds, he's trying to like take his future into his own hands. He's skimming off the top of the accounts. He says that he cares about the poor, but really he cares about himself. He's just trying to sound pious. But again, John, the author, he gives us another wink and nod and he fills in the reader on what really is going on. He did this previously with Caiaphas and now again with Judas. He's like, get it? <laughs> See? Um, have you heard of the term slacktivism? Uh, I think it's a new word. I really like it. A slacktivist is essentially like an online only activist. He or she only wants to publicly say the right things, to use the right hashtag, to change their profile picture, to be on the right side of whatever the current issue is. But in reality, they don't really care. They have no skin in the game. They want to give the appearance of righteousness or social engagement. But in reality, their actual life is just incredibly lukewarm and unengaged with the things that they say that they're passionate about online. Guys, Judas is the original slacktivist. He pretends to be one things with his words but he's doing the opposites with his actions. So we have this kind of as a contrast. Judas with his pretend devotion and greedily taking care of his future into his own hands. And then we have Mary in wholehearted devotion. She pours out the whole of her future on the feet of Jesus. Uh, she takes like the precious vial of spikenard oil, and, and she pours it out upon the feet of Jesus. Now, instead of me explaining to you about how essential oils work, instead I'm going to let my wife Rachel have a few minutes and she is going to explain what spikenard is, where it comes from, and she's gonna do a much better job 
than I ever could. She's a bit of an enthusiast. So here she is. Hi, I love essential oils. Um, I just counted and I have 104 bottles of essential oils. Don't worry, it's because my mom is a distributor and so she gives me a lot of them. I use them for so many things, room spray, moisturizer, I put them in my diffuser, I make hand sanitizer, put them in the bath, so many uses. Now, what I have here is a 30 milliliter bottle of spikenard oil. Now, this was the same um, oil that Mary used to anoint Jesus' feet. This is a very, very precious oil. It's made from the roots of the spikenard plant, which grows in the mountains of India. And um, it was used by the Romans and the ancient Egyptians um, for perfume. It has a load of other uses as well, but they mainly used it for perfume. Now, to get just a very small amount of this oil, it's a process called steam distillation. And so what you do is you gather a ton of the roots, you dry them, you crush them, and then you pass steam through them. That releases the essential oils out of the dried roots. And what you're left with at the end is a layer of water on the bottom and a small layer of essential oil at the top. So you can see why this is so precious and why Mary's pint of oil actually cost an entire year's wages. Now, this 30 milliliter bottle of spikenard today would cost about 450 euro. Now, don't freak out. Um, Mike bought this oil for me a few years ago in Jerusalem and paid merely a, a few shekels for it. And that is how I know, well, that is one of the reasons why I am assured that this is actually um, not pure spikenard. The other way that you can tell is just from smelling it. I wish I could share this with you. So true spikenard has a really kind of woody, deep scent. That's definitely here, but what I can mostly smell is um, cheap perfume. <laughs> and it's also diluted into olive oil. So most of what you see here is just olive oil. Um, so Mike does love me. He just doesn't love me 450 euro worth. Just a couple of shekels. Back to you, Mike. Okay, wow. Well, thank you, Rachel. I'm really glad to to get her involved and, and wasn't that cool? Uh, I was trying to think of ways to get her involved and you know, plan A, she actually said no to. Um, plan A was I was gonna have her wash my feet with her hair, <laughs> but she, for some reason, she said no. So instead, um, we get to learn about the history of essential oils from her. And uh, I think that's a better idea. All right, so this was very likely for Mary, like the entirety of her savings. Um, this could have been like her dowry. This could have been her hope chest or the ancient equivalent of her stock portfolio, her, her retirement fund. Um, Judas points out in verse six that this is like a year's wages. Now to put it into today's terms, um, the latest CSO stats came out just in June, actually. And they said as of 2019, the average Irish income is 49,000 euro per year. And so imagine this one lavish act of putting down basically 50 grand and saying, Jesus, I just want to say thank you. Like, I, I just want to show you that you're important to me. You're valuable to me. And I want to honor you in this way. So investing in oils is like this wise venture since it never lost its value and, and it could be sold if there ever is a urgent need. And, and note that it says that, you know, she poured it out. You know, and, and there's no like, screw top lid on these ancient containers. Elsewhere, it's referred to as like an alabaster flask, and it would have to be broken open. Um, it's like popping the cork off a bottle of champagne. You know, it doesn't really go back or better. It's like squeezing the toothpaste out of a tube. 
um, once it's open and poured out, there's no way to, to gather it up and put it back once again. So we're used to, in our day, we're used to like a free trial month of almost any service or a sample or like this carefully measured distribution. But, but when it comes to Mary and her feelings of gratitude, appreciation, and worship of Jesus of Nazareth, she foregoes all moderation. She discards any self preserving budgeting methods when it comes to the extent of her worshipful sacrifice. Hey, so guys, pay attention here. This is the most important part. She knows instinctively what we are slow to learn ourselves. And here's what it is. And I might sound fanatical, but this is the truth. When it comes to Jesus, it actually is all or nothing. Jesus is not interested in being your hobby. He is not interested in being merely an influencer in your life. He doesn't settle for being one voice amongst many. Rather, he is the voice that silences all others. She gets that. She gets that he is more important than anything else. You know, it was sung earlier in this service, Christ alone, cornerstone. She saw him as the true, valuable one. There's an ancient Irish hymn that we sing sometimes that says, Heart of my own heart, whatever be all, befall, still be my vision, a ruler of all. That he is all, he truly is all, he is the cornerstone. And so this kind of glimpse of like her appreciation of, of Jesus, she appreciates him more than like her life savings. And, and this is like this glimpse of like this worship for her and a reminder to us of the true value of Christ. And I think that there are two aspects of, of worship sometimes. And I think both of them are kind of on display here in Mary's um, sacrifice of her alabaster flask full of the spikenard. Um, I think on the one hand, it seems to be this like spontaneous act of complete gratitude. You know, she is so thankful to have her brother back. But I know that it's more than just an un, unplanned act of spontaneity. And here's why I know this, two different reasons. Number one, time has passed. This is a, there's been a few days that have elapsed between verse 44 of chapter 11 and here we find ourselves at the dinner party in chapter 12. There's been a few days she's thought this through. Number two, it's not at her house. She is at the house of, remember, Simon the leper, which means that she brought the flask with her. She brought the spike nard with her because she planned in advance that she's going to do this. She makes a plan. She makes a choice. She follows through. So sometimes there is this spontaneity. Sometimes I just find myself being like, wow, thank you, Lord. And it just kind of just comes out because I just see a fresh um, uh, example of him at work in my life or at work in the life of Calvary Cork or, or seeing him in some of your lives where I just think, wow, wow, God, thank you. And there's other times, here's the second aspect of worship. Sometimes it's just something that bubbles up out of us. And other times it's a conscious choice that we decide to do. It's not spontaneous. It's deliberate. And I think of this verse in Hebrews chapter 13. It says, Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Sometimes worship, rather than bubbling up, sometimes worship is a costly sacrifice when it involves the will, the mind, and say, I will do this. I will show my appreciation of the Lord Jesus Christ, even if it might be costly or challenging or hard. It's a sacrifice of praise. And I can say, 
personally. And I'm talking, I'm kind of going back and forth. Uh, to some degree, I have like singing in mind, but I think we all know this, that worship is so much more than only the songs that we sing. But but I've made decisions, and I know that I've decided to sing, although I don't feel like it, or to serve, although I'd rather not, to, to worship in any number of ways. And I found oftentimes that is the entryway into a greater experience of an awareness of the closeness of God. Sometimes saying, I'm going to make a sacrifice of praise. I'm going to give the fruit of my lips. I liked how um, Priscilla Shirer um, put it this way. Worship rolls out the red carpet for the presence of the Lord. It's saying rather than, rather than waiting for the feeling to come upon me, you're saying, hey, listen, I'm just going to roll out the red carpets to you. I'm just going to declare your value and your worth. I'm going to give a sacrifice of praise. The song that Shar sang to us earlier on, I won't let the rocks cry out in my place. We return the breath that you gave with praise. It's saying, I'm not going to let someone else praise you on my behalf. I'm going to do it myself. And then here's kind of a final thought before we close up this section and have one final tiny other little thought before we finish this up. This act of hers, this like, sacrificial, costly devotion. It had like a contagious nature to it. And we're aware of contagious things these days, aren't we? But it says there, verse three, the whole house was filled with the smell of the perfume. Like it it changed the atmosphere of the house. The house had a different odor because of it. Now, I don't know what stage three is going to look like in your household or mine, but for a lot of us, or for some of us anyway, it means we are going to be in home more than we were for the past two months. But I mean, man, how, how true it is that like an attitude of, of worship or gratefulness or gratitude to the Lord can change the atmosphere of a house, a different odor because of it. But not even just, let's say, the house in general, But think of the two people that smelled of spikenard the most. Other people, you could say, smelled it in the air. But there was two people in the room that had it in their skin, that had it on their hair, that had it in their feet. And that, of course, is Mary and Jesus. That is the the worshiper and the worshipped one. And isn't it true that worship transforms us? more and more into the image of our Savior. This is pure speculation at this point, but how do you think Jesus smelled for the rest of Holy Week? Do you think he like rushed to take a bath really quick after that? Do you think that he carried with him that costly scent of spikenard for the rest of his life. And and Mary, who had surely budgeted or saved for that, as it's there in her hair, you know, for those days afterwards, I, I'm sure that she kept that scent with her or on her. The clothes that she was wearing were stained with the scent and she smelled like her savior. And we have this transforming the worshiper becomes more and more like the object of our worship. So cause and effect. The raising of Lazarus caused some people to want to kill Jesus on account of Lazarus. It caused others to want to worship Jesus at dinner with Lazarus. And then thirdly, super briefly, we see that the religious leaders decide to kill Lazarus because of Jesus. What a surprising effect to a wonderful cause. Verse nine, the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there. They came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Like, on on the one hand, isn't that ridiculous? (coughs) 
like he already died. Like what more can you do to him? You know, I was like double jeopardy. Um, if there's someone, whatever. So it's, it's silly on the one hand, like, He's already died and come back to life. Like, do you really think killing him is going to silence this story? Um, but this reminds us of, of two quick little truths. Uh, number one, Jesus will unpack this later on in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 25. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hates you. And so just as much as we have the worshiping Mary is identified in scent with Jesus. Here we have the resurrected Lazarus who's identified with Jesus and that now they both bear the opposition of the same religious leaders, okay? So there's that. And then another just interesting comment on this is from Andreas Kostenberger. He says, this betrays an astounding refusal to allow their beliefs to be changed by undeniable facts. They would rather destroy the evidence than change their minds. This is not rational behavior, but sin produces irrational action. So what these guys are, they're not saying, oh, it's all a trick. It's just a magician's ruse. He's like, no, he really did it. And rather than fall down and worship him, instead, they plan to add a second man onto their hit list because of it. Okay, so we have the instigating event. Lazarus is raised, and that causes two people to be put on the hit list of the Sanhedrin. And it causes that one person, Jesus Christ, to be elevated, lifted high, worshipped, adored by Mary. A final thought as we conclude. We certainly do want to celebrate and learn from Mary's like wholehearted devotion. Like we want to learn from that. I want that more and more in my life. She was devoted to Jesus. But and I hope you're I hope you're listening. Here's what's even more important. Jesus was wholeheartedly devoted to Mary and to you as well. I don't want this whole sermon to be about our devotion towards him whilst not recognizing his supreme love for his people. Uh, Jesus is the one who came not to pour out an expensive bottle of spikenard, but he's the one who came to pour out his precious blood. Um, Jesus did not come to pour out the equivalent of a year's worth of his life, but on the cross, Jesus gave his whole life to you. He didn't break an alabaster flask, but he allowed his body to be broken. Jesus truly is the broken one. And then to remind you of that verse from chapter 11, he is the one who dies for his people so that the whole nation doesn't perish. And not just the nation, but to gather into one all the children of God who are scattered abroad in Cork and far beyond. So Jesus loves his people with a sacrificial, giving, pouring out love. And I want you to know that today. So he is the cause, and now we live in the effect. And the question is, will we reject him like the Sanhedrin and like Judas? um, Or will we wholeheartedly embrace him by faith and worship as Mary? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your broken and poured out life and this broken and poured out um, alabaster flask of oil is on the one hand it's it's a worthy offering that she gave to you but on the other hand it's totally insufficient in that it's nothing compared to what you did for her and for the men and the women 
the children who are watching this even today. Um, you have loved us to death, and I thank you for that. You've loved us to the grave and back. Uh, I pray that as we you know, enter into a, another challenging season, that your presence in our homes, that your presence in our lives would be a source of encouragement and strength. I pray that our houses can can smell like you, that there'd be an, uh, an aroma of Christ in our lives and even in the places where we live and dwell. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so thank you so much for joining me from, from my couch to yours. And now we have uh, just a few more songs from Shar. And you can feel free to sing or you can feel free to just silently listen and consider these things. But okay, over to Balancholic to Shar. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Um, I loved, I was really excited about this passage um, this week. It just really hit me. Um, you know, sometimes it just hits you. It really hit me um, when I was reading it this week. So, yeah, um, we're going to sing a couple of songs uh, to finish off. Um, it's been nice. My fingers are absolutely ruined, and I've only just done three songs. <laughs> so, yeah, hmm, ouch. <laughs> I'm going to have to get back into the swing of playing guitar. But, uh, yeah, basically we're going to sing three, um, three songs now, and, uh, yeah just dwell on what we've learned um today uh through the through the to the teaching thanks mike um so first song is hidden we haven't sung it in ages so yeah it's great As I go and as I change, may I love you more deeply, and I lean upon your grace, and I will read because your goodness is on it.
They shout your name. They give you reverence, and I, I will do the same with all my heart.
carry it now. Lord, thank you that we can stand with you. We are yours. You have given us the power to stand. You have given us the hand to hold, the strength for any battle. And Lord, I just thank you that, that we can be in you, Lord. We can be strong through you. We can conquer everything that lies before us, Lord, because we are in you. We were deeply rooted in you the day that we gave our lives to you, Lord. And that does not change and that does not waver. And it's the only thing at the moment that doesn't waver. There's so much up and there's so much down and there's so much confusion and heartache and trial. But you, you are steadfast. You are true. And you do not waver. So I just thank you that you are, you are my friend. You are my God. You are my saviour. And you are my strength. I just thank you this morning. I give all the praise to you. In your precious name. Amen.